Thank you for coming. My name is Dawn Hassman, and I am a certified <laughs> hypnotherapist and also an EFT, um, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique Tapping Practitioner. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited that I was invited back to present because I presented last year and it was a lot of fun. So I'm really excited that you guys are here. And so who has ever been to a hypnotherapist or been to a stage hypnosis? Okay, one, two? Okay, great. To stage hypnosis or to a hypnotherapist? Stage hypnosis. Stage hypnotherapist. Okay. Or both, I guess. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so most of you are probably wondering, what is hypnosis? Now hypnosis is just a very natural state. We all go in and out of hypnosis all day long. We're just not taught that it's called such. So examples of this would be daydreaming, you know, if you're in class and all of a sudden your mind wanders to something completely unrelated, that's a form of hypnosis. Who has ever driven down the freeway and missed their exit because all of a sudden you're home, you're like, how did I even get home? I don't remember driving home. Or you missed your exit because your mind wanders to something else. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> That's also a form of hypnosis. Reading a book, watching TV, um, going to the movies. You know, if you think about it for a moment, you're getting caught up in the words and the emotions and the drama of the movie or the book and you can have emotional reactions to that, right? That's what we call um, hypersuggestibility. So hypnosis is just, just a natural state. Again, it's a focused state of awareness or a heightened state of what we call focused concentration or hypersuggestibility. And I'm sure there's probably some people in this room who've even experienced, you know, sort of being in a big crowd or being around negative people and you can kind of tend to take that on a little bit. That could also be a form of hypnosis. And the 30 minutes when you first wake up and the 30 minutes when you first, uh, right before bed, is when your mind is naturally open and suggestible. So during those time periods, you wanna be really careful about what you're bringing into your mind frame. Are you on Facebook? Are you watching horror movies right before you go to bed? Are you watching the news and therefore can't sleep because your mind starts you know, ruminating about all the negativity in the, in the media these days? So you really want to be careful, especially during those time periods, what you're bringing into your, into your mind frame and into your space. And I'm sure you guys have probably seen this image before. This is the classic iceberg. And more current studies are showing that only about 5% of why we do what we do and our habits are conscious activities. The, re the other 95% is really subconscious. It's under that layer of the, um, of the water. So it really shows you that you have to be able to access your conscious and your subconscious mind in order to really direct your life. Because just having the conscious awareness, and we'll go a little bit more into that, is just not enough. You know, say you're making a big decision and you're conscious with your logic and your reasoning and your willpower and your decision making skills says, I want this, but your subconscious programming, your life script is different. Who, who's gonna run the show? the 95% or the 5%. So that's why hypnotherapy and hypnosis work can be really important. So this is what we call TOM, or the theory of the mind. And this sort of explains a little bit about how hypnosis and suggestibility works. So again, when I went to school, they averaged about 88% was the subconscious and only 12% was the conscious, but more current studies, again, are showing that more like 95 to 5%. So down in this um, subconscious area of the mind, you have your primitive mind, which everyone is born with. We're all pretty much born with a blank slate. And in the primitive area of the mind houses what we call, I'm sure you guys have heard these terms before, the fight, flight, or freeze response. That's that survival mode. You know, say you're in the jungle and you're, you know, come across a tiger, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, am I gonna fight the tiger? Am I gonna flee the tiger or am I gonna play dead and play freeze? In our modern society, most of us don't live in the jungle anymore. We're in modern society. And the modern equivalent of that fight, flight, and freeze mode is now stress, anxiety, and depression. So we all have this primitive area of the mind. And what happens is from about zero to eight years old, we have um, the, what's call that automatic behavior that we learn, and two of the ways that we learn is by identification 
and association. So we're all taking in this information and just the fact that it happened and we're familiar with it, it becomes what's called a known in the subconscious mind. So then we have what's called the critical area of the mind and that forms after about eight years old. And the critical area of the mind is the function that you're using right now to analyze what I'm saying. Does this make sense to me? Does this, you know, is this logic and reasoning? So the conscious area of the mind houses your logic, your reasoning, your willpower, and your decision and analyzation skills. But again, if you go to make a change in your life, say for example, you wanna stop smoking, what happens is that idea goes down in and gets stopped, paused at that critical area of the mind. And the critical area of the mind says, okay, hold on, we have to check with the subconscious programming. But say when you were younger, you know, when you're a teenager, you had a really stressful moment and you started smoking as a coping mechanism, then your subconscious mind is gonna kick that idea out. So what we do in hypnotherapy is through getting someone into that state of hypnosis, which again is just that very natural state, we're able to bypass that critical area of the mind so we can get in the subconscious programming to change any of those sort of negatives into positives and make those lifelong changes. And if anyone has any questions at any time, just um, feel free to raise your hand. <coughs> so what's the difference between stage and therapeutic hypnosis? Stage hypnosis is really just for entertainment value. Hypnotherapy and therapeutic hypnosis is really, you know, more counseling and guiding someone. And during a session, um, the hypnotherapist doesn't have control over you. And basically, we're guiding someone into that state. But it's really, all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis because, again, the hypnotherapist is just guiding them into that state. So why I became a hypnotherapist? Basically, I started having health issues when I was three years old, and I'd been through that whole wheel of going to the doctors and major medications and pharmaceutical drugs, and I just always felt like there was something more that I could be doing for my own life to improve my health. So what I did is, um, uh, in about five, six years ago, I went back to school and studied hypnotherapy, and I've been seeing clients ever since. I do work with doctors and other mental health, uh, health professionals as part of the wellness team, and I'll talk more about that. So what happens in a session? Basically, someone comes in, you know, I've talked to them over the phone, kind of got an idea of what they want to work on. I would say the majority of the people come in for stress, you know, anxiety issues. Um, sometimes you'll see someone who wants to lose weight or stop smoking. I also work a lot with pain management and pre and post surgery hypnosis. So we do an intake, we do a cognitive portion of the session, and I talk about um, you know, that you can't be controlled, you can't be stuck in hypnosis to dispel any fears. And then I go over with the client that theory of mind, that uh, one that we went over earlier, and then we do what's called um, suggestibility testing. Because some people learn more inferentially and some people learn more literally. So what we'll do is we'll do some suggestibility testing to determine that. And it's not you know, any kind of testing that you can pass or fail, just everything gives you some information. And then we do what's called an induction into hypnosis. So that could be you know, picking a point on the ceiling or visualizing and imagining. Um, so we do what's called an induction, get someone into that, that state and there's different levels of um, deepness into hypnosis and then we give positive suggestions, whether they be direct suggestions or little literal suggestions, or uh, we use imagery. So there's many different techniques. And then we count someone out out of that state of hypnosis. So are you guys up for doing a little couple exercises? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is called just some suggestibility testing. So is every, if everyone's comfortable, go ahead and put your arms out. And um, if you're comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. Now, just visualize and imagine in your left hand that I'm putting a heavy bag of sand. And in your right hand, visualize and imagine that I'm putting a string of red 10 helium balloons in your right hand attached to your thumb. So your left hand and arm is gonna get heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier, and your right hand and arm is gonna get lighter and lighter 
and lighter and lighter. And your left hand and arm is gonna get heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And your right hand and arm is gonna get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. Just visualizing and imagining that heavy bag of sand and those 10 large helium balloons. Now open your eyes and look at your hands. See if they moved or didn't at all. There you go. Shake that out and do that again. Close your eyes. And now just visualize and imagine that heaviness and that lightness again for a few moments. Just imagining that heavy bag of sand and those 10 large helium balloons in your right hand. Okay, open your eyes. Now just notice if they did the same, if they moved the same or didn't. Okay. So that's what we call some suggestibility testing. And all that means the second time is if your hands move the same amount as the first time when I was verbalizing it, is that you can take in information more inferentially than literally, that's all that means. So knowing if someone takes an in information literally or inferentially, that gives me more information to best serve the client and craft the suggestions under hypnosis in an inferred or literal way. Does that make sense? Okay. So what's our toolbox? Again, what we just kind of went over, direct suggestions, which could be uh, literal or inferred, and then also EFT tapping. And one of the ways that EFT tapping and hypnosis works is it calms down the fight, flight, and freeze response and activates the parasympathetic nervous system and helps to create new neural pathways. Another way we can do it is systematic desensitization. And in that type of technique, what we do is we um, have someone visualize you know, a safe place, whether it be out by the beach or their favorite place in, um, in nature, perhaps it's you know, on a pathway or it's by the ocean or um, you know, out on a hike. And then what we do is we go back into, say, uh, say someone has a fear of public speaking. So we get them into that safe place and by an idiot, what we call an idiomotor idi response, we get a confirmation or a head nod that they're in that safe place and feeling calm and relaxed. And then we have the client visualize and imagine that they're up in front of a group of people and that they're feeling calm and relaxed while they're speaking and going through the process of what they have the fear about. Or for example, fear of flying or fear of spiders. We do the same thing. We get them into that safe place where they're feeling calm and relaxed, and then we have them visualize being on the flight, sitting down, putting their, you know, all the steps throughout the process that they're trying to be more comfortable with. And that's called systematic desensitization. And therapeutic guided imagery is also very powerful. Um, some people call it guided imagery, some people call it guided meditation. It's really pretty much all the same. And basically what that is, is that's guiding someone through an imagery process or having them come up with their own imagery based on what they've told you thus far. And that's very helpful because one of the way your, mind's, your mind learns is in images. And even if someone can't get, like if I said, you know, close your eyes and imagine a pink elephant. Some people would actually see that picture in their mind. Some people could just imagine it or visualize it or sense it or just have a knowing about it. And everyone can visualize. Like if I said to close your eyes and imagine your living room, almost everyone could, could do that to some extent. So um, that's how we use guided imagery. And it's very powerful. And you can also use archetypes and you know, different um, systems like that. And the University of uh, Penn State Medicine um, also found that hypnotic imagery yielded a significantly heightened amount of natural killer or MK cells. And um, you know, neuroscience, different places, have found that imagery elevated the immune system functioning and how cell-specific imagery positively, positively affects corresponding white blood cells, neutrophils, and lymphocytes. So it can be very, especially for cancer patients, that's a big thing with imagery. And how it gained popularity? In 1958, the American Medical Association and American Psychological Association recognized hypnosis as a valid medical procedure. Also, the NIH has recommended as a treatment for chronic pain, um, enhanced sense of control for chronic illnesses, reducing fear and phobias and anxiety, 
before and after mental and dental procedures. Um, you've also probably heard that there's people who have gone through major medical procedures without using an any anesthesia. Actually, I've had two knee surgeries, and the second knee surgery I had was while I was going to school. So I went to the teacher who taught the pre-surgery hypnosis, same surgery, two years apart, just on different knees, and I had less bleeding, I needed less pain medicine, and my recovery was a lot quicker doing the pre-surgery hypnosis. So I can tell from experience it really does help. Also, the Mayo Clinic you know, endorses hypnotherapy for stress, anxiety, before medical procedures. Um, also, Dr. Wheel, I mentioned to um, Melissa earlier that uh, I work with a rheumatologist at UCLA Santa Monica, and she actually is big into integrative medicine. Her name is Dr. Mahala Taylor, and um, she refers me a lot of clients, and she just uh, finished her fellowship with Dr. Wheel in, um, in Phoenix at his facility there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said it was like pre-surgery uh, hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. Is there, what if like you were already in like um, physical pain? Is there a way like, like hypnotherapy can help that or does it have to be before? No, it can be used for um, chronic pain, chronic or acute, acute pain. It doesn't have to be beforehand. It can be used for that as well, yes. Okay. So if someone had an injury or say for example, they go to their doctor and nothing is physically wrong, but they're still hurting. Sometimes that can be trapped emotional pain, it can be trapped trauma, and that's something that hypnotherapy and EFT will kind of dig out. But you have to give it some time for those types of things. You know, usually it's not like an instant. And hypnotherapy, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna go once and I'm gonna be cured. We don't cure people, we help you guys access the tools that are already inside of you. And it's not, it's not a magic bullet, it's not, you know, I wish I had a wand, it can make everything go away, but unfortunately it's work. Just like when you go to hip, or you go to physical therapy and they give you exercises to do. If you don't do the exercises between your appointment, what's gonna happen? You're probably not gonna get better, or it's gonna be very slow moving. So yes, it can absolutely be used for chronic and acute pain for something that's already happened. And again, we work as an adjunct to your wellness team. So our hypnotherapist scope of practice is avocational and vocational self-improvement. But we can work with people who have, do have mental or um, physical diagnoses under the acknowledgement and consent of their doctor or their uh, psychologist. So we can definitely do that. Um, just to you know, make sure that there's no contraindications. So we're basically an adjunct. And where I trained was the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Tarzana, and it's a year program. I've had 720 hours of training. Um, HMI was the first accredited college in California for hypnotherapy. And the second six months of the training is actually a residency under a uh, licensed MFT. So it's a very thorough training. And if you ever do have a client who's going to, or a patient, who is going to go to a hypnotherapist, make sure you check their training because someone can go to a week, uh, you know, two weekend courses and call themselves a hypnotherapist. So you wanna make sure that the person's had an appropriate and proper amount of training. Okay, so who has heard of EFT or meridian tapping? Okay, so a lot of you. And um, has anyone done it before? Except when you did it last year with me. <laughs> Okay, so EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique um, or EFT Meridian Tapping. It's basically how I describe it. It's, it's acupuncture for your emotions but without the needles. Who's done acupuncture here? Okay, so a lot of you. So many of you are I'm sure are familiar with the meridian points and the um, uh, Eastern medicine believes that there's these meridian points that go through our body. And science proves that we do have electricity in our body because we can monitor the brain and heart waves via EEGs and EKGs. And so that's proven. So we all have this energy, this electrical system that's carried in our body through these tiny pathways called meridians. So basically what EFT is, is it's lightly tapping with the fingertips on these end meridian points while you're talking about a negative emotion, physical discomfort, um, or anything else that's been, that's distressing you. 
And the fact that it's even coming up in your awareness means that it there's a charge there for you. So the basis and the theory behind EFT is that all negative emotions and some physical pain can be a disruption in that body's electrical system. So if you can imagine a TV, for example. So imagine you have the cord going from the electrical outlet to the appliance, the TV. So what happens if you go and start putting little, you know, take a knife and pulling little tears and holes in the cord, in the electrical cord, what's gonna happen? It's not gonna work as well. There's gonna be interruptions or if you guys remember the old TVs, you know, little fuzzy lines that would go through the TV. It's gonna be disrupted. So if you can imagine, you know, little comments when we were younger or someone made us feel bad about something or we have perhaps some suppressed guilt or anger or frustration at someone, is all those little emotions that aren't vented out properly become those little tears. And so our body is basically like that electrical cord from the outlet to the TV. So if you imagine all along your lifetime so far, you have all these little tears. So what's gonna happen? Your energy, your electricity isn't gonna flow as well as it should because of all those little tears. So what EFT does is it gets to that, that emotion, that, that disconnect, and it fixes it. It helps fix it and um, therefore, your, therefore your energy and your electrical system can flow more easily and effortlessly. So what can EFT uh, help with? It can help with stress, it can help with anticipatory anxiety, same with hypnotherapy. It can help with chronic health conditions, diagnosis trauma, physical discomfort, aches and pains, uh, negative feelings, you know, whether it be anger, or guilt, or shame, or resentment, and it helps, again, activate uh, that parasympathetic nervous system to get you out of that fight, flight, or freeze response, and uh, fears and phobias as well. So here are the basic EFT tapping points, um, and you guys also have a sheet with this information on it, just a little bit different. So the first tapping point is on the inside of the eyebrows, and you're just lightly tapping with like one or two fingertips. So we'll just kind of go over the points first. So the first point is the inside of the eyebrow. The next point is just the outside of the eyebrow. And then under the nose where you feel the bone, I'm sorry, under the eye where you feel the bone, between the nose and the upper lip, the chin point where you have that little crease in your chin, and then the collarbone point. So it's basically where you feel the bone, just sort of like in the middle where they come and meet. And then under the arm, and then actually on this diagram, but on your sheet it shows there's also some wrist points. There's one in the middle and one on either side. So you can tap your wrists like this or you can bump them together. And then the last point is the top of the head. Okay, so you're all students, right? Okay, so you all have some amount of stress, <laughs> I would imagine, or perhaps test anxiety. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the points. So basically what you, the first thing you do, and this is on your sheet, is you want to address, you want to come up with what is disturbing you. So let's just say, you know, stress from school. Um, so that's the first thing. So everyone just kind of close your eyes for a moment and just think about, all the stress that you're under with your schoolwork and going to classes, balancing it all, and just give it a level in your mind um, from a scale from zero to 10. 10 meaning the most amount of stress you've ever felt and zero meaning no stress at all. So just kind of notice where you're at with that and open your eyes, just keep note of that number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through, let me just come over here. We're gonna do what's called the setup statement. So the setup statement is basically couching a positive with a negative. And a lot of people ask me, why would I wanna focus on the negative? Isn't that reinforcing the stress? In this case, no. You're bringing up the stress with the intention of clearing it and reducing it. So it's, it's a process. And um, so always the goal is to get down to a one or zero. And sometimes, you know, depending on where you started, it may not happen in one sitting. Okay. So there's um, the sort of these tender spots, like right above your chest, or you can do the side of the hand 
between the pinky and the wrist, which is called the karate chop point. So you can either you know go like this, or you can rub the tender spots, whichever feels better to you. So we're gonna do, we always do rounds of three. So we're gonna do the setup statement three times, and then we're gonna do three rounds of tapping. So everyone just kind of repeat after me, and if there is a word I'm saying that doesn't resonate, feel free to insert your own word, or just think it in your mind. Okay, even though, even though I'm so stressed, I'm so stressed, because I'm a college student, <laughs> I deeply and completely, love and accept myself. And uh, try not to cross your arms. You want to make sure your arms, arms and legs are uncrossed, please. Even though, even though I'm so stressed out, I'm so stressed out. So much pressure being in college. So much pressure being in college. <laughs> I deeply and completely, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Love and accept myself. Even though, even though I'm so stressed out, I'm so stressed out. College is so much pressure. College is so much pressure. I deeply and completely, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Love and accept myself. And then we'll start at the tapping point. So inside of the eyebrow, so stressed out. So stressed out. And you can do one hand, both hands, or alternate. Just don't cross over. Um, outside of the eyebrow, I'm so stressed out. I'm so stressed out. Under the eye, I'm so stressed out. I'm so stressed out. Under the nose, all this work. All this work. The chin point, I'm so stressed out. I'm so stressed out. Collarbone, there's so much pressure to perform. There's so much pressure to perform. Under the arm, taking all those tests. Taking all those tests. The wrist point, so much stress. So much stress. Top of the head, all the stress stresses me out. All the stress stresses me out. <laughs> Inside the eyebrow, all the stress. All the stress. Outside the eyebrow, all the stress. All the stress. Under the eye. So much pressure to perform. So much pressure to perform. Under the nose, my parents put all this pressure on me. My parents put all this pressure on me. Chin point, get straight A's. Get straight A's. Collarbone, and to do well on my tests. And to do well on my tests. Under the arm, all this stress. All this stress. Wrist points. It's overwhelming sometimes. It's overwhelming sometimes. Top of the head, and all the social stuff I have to do too. <laughs> and all the social stuff I have to do too. Inside the eyebrow, and all the clubs I have to join. And all the clubs I have to join. Then I gotta look for a job. <laughs> then I gotta look for a job. <laughs> Under the eye, so much stress. So, so much stress. Nose, or the, under the nose, so much stress. So much stress. Chin point, the stress is stressing me out. The stress is stressing me out. Collarbone and all this pressure from family. And all this pressure from family. Under the arm and society to be good. And society to be good. Wrist points, all this stress. All this stress. Top of the head, so much stress. So much stress. Okay, take a deep breath. Okay, and everyone kind of just tune in for a moment with the stress and just kind of give it a uh, level now on a scale from zero to 10. So how many people went down in their level? Okay, good. How many people stayed the same? Okay, did anyone go up? And wherever you're at is fine. Okay, no one went up, good. Okay, so the goal is to get it down. And once you get down to about a seven or a zero, you can start bringing in positives. You can start bringing in, you know, even though I'm stressed out, I wanna to begin to release this, and I choose instead to feel calm and confident. And then you can start bringing that into the tapping. So, um, did anyone have any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, what was the importance of not crossing? Um, you just wanna, um, it's, you just wanna make sure you're open, and by crossing, sometimes you can block yourself energetically. Okay. So, you know, even if you're doing any kind of like meditation or deep breathing, um, work, you know, you want to make sure you keep your arms and legs uncrossed if possible because it's just sort of a gesture of being open uh, to receive and to release. So, um, okay, great. Well, let's um, do another round so we can bring in the positives. Um, so who's, um, is anyone like above a seven? Is everyone a seven or below? Okay, perfect. So, um, so then we can start bringing in the positives. 
And, um, and this can also be used, again, for like anticipatory anxiety. Say you have a test or a job interview coming up. And you can imagine, you know, doing this, like, oh, even though I'm so nervous about this job interview, you know, and just the way I explain it, because a lot of my clients, you know, will do stuff in session and they'll go home and they'll be like, oh, I wasn't sure what to say. You can say the same thing over and over again, just, you know, the stress, the stress, the stress. Or you can mix it up like I did. And the important thing is to just do it. You can't really do tapping wrong. And again, you can, you always want to do it in rounds of threes and then take a reassessment level. You can either do it the left side, the right side, or, or alternate. You know, especially people who maybe have like fibromyalgia or autoimmune stuff where their nervous system is on overdrive. Sometimes they can only maybe do five or 10 minutes at a time because it could overwhelm their, you know, their system. So, um, you know, you can do it in little bits or you can do like a half hour session. But when people get home, how I tell them is just imagining like you're venting to your best friends. You know, you're just basically like spilling everything out that's bothering you. And you want to be the more, the more specific you are, the better. And also, one of the ways I describe tapping and hypnotherapy is sort of peeling the layers of the onion. So say you're starting with stress and all of a sudden you're like, oh God, I remember that thing my sister said to me four years ago and that made me mad or that made me angry or resentful or frustrated. If something like that comes up, it's called an aspect. And if the aspect is a higher intensity than the stress where you started, you wanna move over and do a setup and tap just on that aspect. So, and then what you'll find is once that aspect number starts coming down, you may notice that the stress came down too because that was a subconscious thing that was buried that you're now uncovering because you're starting to tap on the stress. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So let's do another, yes. Sorry, do you have to verbalize what you're thinking about while you do it? Or can it's you focus on it. Focus on it. it. It's best if you're able to verbalize it. But say, for example, you're in an airport or you're, you know, you're not just gonna start blabbing out. Even though I'm afraid to go on this plane because I'm afraid it's gonna crash freak everyone out, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, if you're in a place that you can't verbalize it, even if you just mumble it to yourself, but it is important to voice it. This is really a way, because I know from personal experience that if you like suppress those emotions and don't have an outlet and a way to vent it out, I actually feel like that's where a lot of my health issues came from, was suppressing a lot of anger and guilt and shame over feelings I had towards a certain family member for like 40 years. And, you know, I developed autoimmune stuff and digestive issues. And, you know, one way to describe it is like, suppressed emotions don't just go away. They go in, in the basement and they start lifting weights. You know, they're just, it's just gonna get stronger and stronger and it may come out, whether it be physical symptoms or, you know, issues with sleeping. It man suppressed emotions manifest themselves in different ways. So it's really important that you let it out, whether it's running or tapping or meditation or breathing, you have to find a way to vent out what's bothering you, in my opinion. So um, <coughs> does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so it's best if you verbalize it because again, it's getting it out. Um, but again, if you're at a place that you can't verbalize and just try to mumble it, but um, that would be my suggestion. So let's just do that round just so you can kind of see how you can bring in the positives. So we'll continue with the stress. Um, so inside the eyebrow, all the stress. All the stress. Bless you. <laughs> outside the eyebrow, all the stress. All the stress. Under the eye. Being a college student is really stressful sometimes. Being a college student is really stressful sometimes. <laughs> Under the nose, especially at UCLA. <laughs> especially at UCLA. Chin point. But I want to release this. But I don't want to release this. Stress. 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 Collarbone. I want to let it go. I want to let, let it go. go. Under the arm. And I choose instead. And I choose instead. Wrist points to feel calm and relaxed. To feel calm and relaxed. Top of the head. Focused and calm. Focused and calm. Inside the eyebrow. So all the stress. So all the stress. Outside the eyebrow. It doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve me. Under the eye. It doesn't make anything better. It doesn't make anything better. 
under the nose. So I give myself permission to let it go. So I give myself permission to let it go. Chin point. I give myself permission to release it now. I give myself permission to release it now. Collarbone. And I choose instead. And I choose instead. To feel calm and relaxed. To feel calm and relaxed. Under the arm to give myself a break. To give myself a break. Wrist points. To feel focused and concentrated. To feel focused and concentrated. Top of the head. And to just let it go. And to just let it go. Inside of the eyebrow, easily and gently. Easily and gently. Outside of the eyebrow, I give myself permission. I give myself permission. Under the eye. To feel calm and relaxed. To feel calm and relaxed. Under the nose, I choose instead. I choose instead. Chin point, to love myself completely. To love myself completely. Collar blown. To feel calm and relaxed. To feel calm and relaxed. Under the arm, to live in the present moment. To live in the present moment. Wrist points, to feel joy and love. To feel joy and love. Top of the head, and peaceful and calm. And peaceful and calm. Okay, take a deep breath. Nice. How's everyone feeling? Calm and relaxed? Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so you have, and you guys have sheets on the EFT, but uh, this is a basic recipe. And there are also more advanced techniques that I can do one-on-one -on -one with people in any session. Um, but this is what they call the basic recipe. Um, so again, you know, rounds of threes, um, just try not to cross over. And the goal is to get down to a one or a zero. It may not happen in one sitting. Um, so... And when you get down to a five or below, since you know we didn't go around, say you can uh, do the setup statement again and change the wording to even though I still have some of this stress, I deeply and completely love and accept myself, and then keep going with the I want to let it go, I want to dissolve it, I choose instead to feel calm and relaxed and love myself. Um, so, did anyone have any questions on that? So that's uh, the presentation for today, and I'm trying to uh, <coughs> think of anything else. So, in my, um, I see clients out of uh, my West LA office in Brentwood, and but it's also possible to see people all over the world via Skype and FaceTime, which is really great. So, um, yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> So I got into hypnotherapy, um, so because I, I just always felt there was something more I could be doing for my emotions, for my well-being, and like I said, I have sort of been in that circle of, you know, doctors. When I was three years old, I developed epilepsy and started having grand mal seizures. I was fortunate that it resolved itself when I was about 12 years old. But then in my um, 20s, I started, um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is the autoimmune thyroid. And then um, about 10 years ago, um, and I also in my 30s started having really bad digestive issues. And then started, was diagnosed with some other autoimmune stuff. And um, I just kept hearing about hypnotherapy and I had been going to a regular therapist and said, oh, do you know any hypnotherapist? So I've been hearing about it, it's been popping up, you know, sort of my frame of reference. And she's like, no, no, no. And then I kept, kept popping up in my life. And so finally I just, you know, went online and I looked at the curriculum and it just sounded so fascinating. And I looked at that program and I also looked at uh, University of Santa Monica, which was would have been an MBA in spiritual psychology. But what I liked about the hypnotherapy school is that there was a certain career path where University of Santa Monica was like, yeah, you had your MBA in spiritual psychology, but there wasn't really like a set career path. And I love the fact that even just after a year and six months in the program, we started seeing clients. And again, I personally just sort of, I knew I had a lot of like anger inside of me and guilt and shame were the two emotions that I suppressed for a really long time. 
And I really strongly believe that those stuck emotions contributed to the, um, to the diagnoses I was getting. And you know, I think modern medicine's great, Western medicine is, is great, but c it can only take you so far. And when you start to hear doctors say, you know, I don't know what's wrong, I don't know what's going on, you know, we've done all the tests, nothing's explained, I knew there had to be something more that I could be doing personally for my own health and my own life. And to give you an example, I used to kind of run around with my heart like racing all the time. Like if I would stop and before I'd go to sleep, I would just hear my heart racing all the time, even though on medical tests it was fine, but it was that constant low grade stress and anxiety. And in just the one year that I went through the hypnotherapy training, the 720 hours, my um, sed rate came down, which is one of the markers of inflammation, and a lot of my autoimmune lab work that had been abnormal for like seven years came with a normal range. I did the pre-surgery hypnosis, and I just started seeing what a difference that it made in my own life and my own health, even on the lab work it showed. So I just knew that there was something to this, and that's, you know, some people take the training just for their own well-being and their own personal health and some people go on to be actually become certified hypnotherapists so i did t decide to take that next step and that's when i started seeing clients and you know i've helped people with insomnia i've helped people with chronic pain with stuck emotions it's just it just was so rewarding i'd worked in real estate for like 15 years and even though i was good at my job and i you know was making decent money it just wasn't fulfilling and i just you know i was in my early 40s and i'm like I just, I need to find something that I'm passionate about. So I went to school and I was, I was just hooked. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. Thank you. Yes. Is it harder to treat patients who are more inference based than, or more literal than inference based? Um, I would say not necessarily. I think, um, you know, just knowing what the difference is and how to approach the two ways. Um, but I, I don't think it's, it's more difficult now. I just think it's a matter of knowing, you know, doing the testing to know their suggestibility so you know how to craft the suggestions that will most quickly get to their subconscious mind. Yes? Is it still easy for you to work with patients or help patients who are highly skeptical of hypnotherapy with this kind of, this kind of work? Sometimes, um, you know, if someone's really resistant, it may just take longer for it to work or for them to, but you know, in the first session, you know, they always teach you about how to be in rapport with someone and how to sort of, you know, help gain that trust. So I don't think that someone doesn't need to believe it's gonna work, they just need to want it to work. You know, especially like if we get a lot of calls for people who want to stop smoking. Well, why do you want to stop smoking? Because my doctor's telling me to. Because my spouse wants me to. Because my kids. And the first thing I say is you're going to waste your money and your time. If you don't want to make that change, if you're not the one doing it for you, it's probably not going to work. And that's what I tell, you know, again, like going to a physical therapist. If you go once a week or once every two weeks, if you don't do the steps in between, it's probably not gonna to help. So someone really, it's a participatory process. Again, it's not something, you know, it's not me doing anything. It's me providing you with tools to help yourself. So that's the way I try to explain it to people. But sometimes people do come in and they think, oh, I'll do a couple sessions and be cured. That's really not that realistic. So I really try in the um, phone conversation with someone to really ask those questions. Like, what, what is your motivation to lose weight? What is your motivation and your willingness to put in the time? Because it is, it's a conditioned process. If you think about, you know, growing up, all those, you know, things that you learned and the way we learned from like zero to eight, when you think about kids, your mind is like a sponge. You know, like if I told everyone, okay, this is an elephant. If you grew up, everyone telling you that this is an elephant, and all of a sudden you're 20 years old, someone's like, no, that's a water bottle. You're like, no, that's an elephant, because that's what you learned. That's what you were conditioned to call this, right? So it's the same thing, you know, if someone grew up with parents saying, oh, you're worthless, you're never going to amount to anything, you're never going to get any money, and if that's really your belief and you don't get past that, that's what you're going to attract. 
that's what what you believe is what your life becomes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yes. So mindfulness has been like a very hot topic lately. Mm -hmm. um, how would you say hypnosis is related to that, or like how one of them plays a role in each other? Um, mm -hmm. Has there been any like have you had any experiences where people approach you with like the more of a well, yeah, I mean, mindfulness really is sort of a form of hypnosis because you're in that focused state of concentration or that focused state of awareness. But mindfulness, unless you're doing like self-hypnosis with it, is you're still in that 5%, you're just in that conscious area of mind. But, you know, some people can kind of like get into a deeper state, but unless you're like saying a mantra or a positive affirmation then you're really just focusing you know when you think about it but I, I think that mindfulness is very important and, and it is one of the aspects of gaining control over the parasympathetic nervous system and that flight fight flight mode you know that's very important but I think that hypnotherapy takes it a step further than just mindfulness but again you know that 30 minutes when you first wake up and that 30 minutes um, before you go to sleep, those are the most important times to really be conscious of what is around you and what messages you're taking in. So, did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Hi. <laughs> did you say this uh, one, two, three, four, five, I know that wide awake, take me for the work if you're going to sleep? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can kind of help snap you out of it. Um, yeah, so if you ever, that's, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. If you do ever feel like you're in class or in a state of that slight hypnosis, you can always count yourself up, and that's the last thing on that sheet. You just say to yourself, one, two, three, four, five, eyes open, wide awake. One, two, three, four, five, eyes open, wide awake. Another thing you can do is the karate, that karate chop point with the tapping. You just like tap here, you know, like 10 times, 10 times a day, and just give yourself like a positive statement. I'm more focused and alert. I'm more focused and alert. I'm more focused and alert. But you never want to do hypnosis while you're driving. And one of the things I do for my clients is I always tape the hypnosis portion of the session, and then I send it to them in an MP3 um, so they can listen to it. Because reinforcement, because again, you're, recon you're reconditioning your subconscious mind. So that takes repetition, law of repetition, law of repeat action. It's something you have to do, you know, and listen to constant, you know, over and over again to help get it and sink into the subconscious mind. Yes? What did you just say about 30 minutes after waking up and 30 minutes before that? Oh, the 30 minutes when you first wake up and the 30 minutes before you go to sleep is the time when your mind is naturally open and suggestible. So it's sort of that, you know, that sleepy time where you're like awake, but you're kind of like falling asleep that 30 minutes before you go to sleep. You know, that's a great time to do positive affirmations, to do positive mantra, or, you know, sing a happy song to yourself because that will help ease you into that sleep state. But when you're in the, in the hypnotic sleep, it's not an unconscious sleep. And I think a lot of people think when they go to hip, a hypnosis session, they're expecting to like fall asleep or pass out and not remember anything. Some people, some of my clients remember everything that I say. Some of my clients, you know, kind of float in and out or, you know, oh, I heard you, but then I sort of drifted off and I came back again. And that's all normal. And every session is, is different. There's no two sessions that are exactly alike. I basically tailor the session to the client and their goals and their needs based on the suggestibility testing. So yeah, that's just the time period that your mind, you know, I'm sure you've heard that sort of like the, what do I call it, the magic 30 minutes or the magic half hour before you go to sleep, just watching, you know, anything that could bother you or disrupt you that's a negative, you want to keep that out for that time period. Okay. Any other questions? These are great questions, by the way. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so I'll be here for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. And thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.